Hello and welcome to BBC News with me, Matthew Amarillo. As we've seen, the G7 summit begins on Friday and this year it's being hosted here in the UK in a five-star hotel in Cornwall on the southwest coast of England. It's worth, first of all, having a look at why it is such an important meeting. The G7 is a group of seven of the world's largest, most advanced economies, including the UK, which currently holds the presidency of the group, the United States, Canada, Germany, France, Italy and Japan as well as representatives from the European Union, all there. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has also invited Australia, India, South Korea and South Africa as guest countries to this year's summit. Well, the main issues on the agenda are COVID-19, the pandemic, the post-pandemic recovery, tackling climate change and promoting free and fair trade. Well, all of those issues affect the way we live now and the planet we live on, but they also impact the next generation. So how relevant is this gathering of, well, relatively old heads of state to people aged 25 and under? And what do they think should be on the table at this G7? Well, let's find out. With me for the next half an hour is Shunta Takino, who's 25 and from Tokyo in Japan, but joins us from Paris. He's the Japanese head delegate of the Y7 group, which is a young persons group affiliated to the G7. 17-year-old Yanda Banda is from Lusaka in Zambia, uh, who's a girls' rights activist and chairperson of the organization Transform Education. Himanshu Sood is 24 and currently in Leeds here in the UK. He's originally from Chandigarh in India and has worked in India on projects to promote social justice, gender equality and sustainability. Well, our final guest is in southeastern Mexico. Estrella Gutierrez is 24 and a junior doctor who spent the entire pandemic working on a COVID ward in a Texas hospital. Welcome all of you to uh, the programme. Estrella, let me start with you. Does it go without saying that nothing prepared you for, for what you actually dealt with in the hospital on a human level? Give me an idea of how gruelling it has been. Well, actually, I mean, the COVID pandemic for all of us, it was, uh, it had no precedent, right? Like not, not present on how you were about, like going to feel on what you were about to see. Like no one would, would have been like, um, no one could have been prepared to leave that. So for me, um, I lived through all of that for over a full year, right? It started all back in, in March. And we would do like long shifts, uh, sometimes from 4.30 a.m. we would be arriving to the COVID unit and then we would leave like all the way to 8, 8 p.m. sometimes doing um, overnight shifts in the same COVID unit. Um, it was, as I said, no precedent. Like you, you, couldn't, um, you couldn't deal with what you were leaving. Uh, no one really knew what to do. Um, we were wearing this uh, PPE, the for like four layers of this big plastic to the point that you couldn't even recognize your partner. So working and communicating and all that was an extra level of difficulty that we had yes. to deal with. And dealing um, with, with death and resuscitation every single day, which must have taken an emotional toll. Uh, uh, Himanshu, let me bring you in because uh, you went back to Pune in February, uh, just ahead of the devastating second wave. Uh, how alarming was the situation there? Absolutely. I mean, um, nobody really expected a second wave to hit in India so hard. And um, during my three months uh, when I was there in India, um, um, you know, the streets were empty, the shops were closed. Um, it was just about maybe once or twice in a week that, you know, for a specific period of time, we were allowed to um, get groceries. Um, but we did, you know, it was, it was easier um, for me and my family to um, gain access to uh, the basic necessities, basic food, groceries for, for on a daily basis, but I'm pretty sure in the inter in interior parts and the you know the, the ru rural parts of um, India, it's been extremely difficult um, with you know getting um, these uh, just basic amenities, um, be it hospital beds, uh, medicines. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's been extremely challenging for um, the 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 you know the rural regions as well as the not so well off parts of India. Shota, let me bring you in from Paris. Just sum up for me the Japanese experience because you didn't have lockdowns there, but uh, they've been very slow, haven't they, in terms of the vaccination rollout? Exactly, and I think that's you know the the overriding challenge that's facing Japan at the moment when we think about the COVID response. 
And linked to that, of course, there's the discussions around whether it's going to be safe to hold the Olympics. Um, and that really looms large in the minds of the public. So actually, we ran a survey of young people in Japan um, to see their views on the Olympics in March to April of this year. And what we found was that more than two thirds actually were against the Olympics or wanted to see it postponed. Um, and really, one of the key concerns there was exactly about whether ho hosting the Olympics is compatible with the slow rollout of vaccinations uh, so far in Japan. And it has sped up considerably in recent weeks, to be fair, but only just over 12% of the people in Japan have received their first vaccine. And that really compares to above 40% in all other G7 countries. I'll, and come, just back to say to, I'll come back to that point because it's so crucial in terms of what the G7 leaders are, uh, are facing here in terms of the challenge on vaccinations. But Yande, let me bring you in because uh, you were in, I think, the last year of school when the pandemic hit. Give me an idea of the impact it had, had on your education and those around you. Thank you so much, Matthew. I think when I, I hear this, I, the pandemic has affected adolescents and young people largely in different areas. Inequalities have deepened and accessing human rights such as education essentially became a privilege instead of a fundamental human rights. I think we have looked at the biggest disruptor of education in modern history. Millions of girls are dropping out of school and have dropped out of school because of the way that the pandemic has hit and they have to subside for their families economically. I mean, fighting this education crisis simply cannot wait. We have to fight it now. It's a matter of urgency. It's a matter of an entire generation and it's a matter of our future. And that's why we're demanding G7 leaders to intensify their resource mobilizations to getting girls back into safer, more inclusive and socially transformative schools. Post COVID, we simply cannot go back to an old normal because normal was never safe. I'll pick up on that point because it is such an important point in a moment or two, but uh, I promised that we'd go back to vaccinations. And before I ask the next question, I want to just put onto the screen uh, a graphics that we have that uh, shows in terms of a global reach uh, the amount, uh, the numbers of uh, first vaccinations that have uh, happened around and in different countries in the world. You'll see that uh, on the graphic there. And then in different parts of the world, we'll also put onto the screen the second doses uh, and uh, that map shows you uh, doesn't it uh, the darker areas where the most vaccines have uh, taken place it shows you the basic inequality that we know exists between rich and poor countries Australia I want to ask you a question about that because we're going to get announcements uh, about the COVAX schemes about uh, the donations from the richer countries Boris Johnson has uh, already committed to offering surplus vaccines to COVAX. But do you think it is, is it the wrong approach for, for the richer countries to only donate once they've vaccinated all of their domestic populations? Is that the wrong approach? Should the donations happen now? Of course, yeah, surely. The donations should happen like now. People are getting sick now, not after. Like people don't get, uh, uh, one, one, one of them, they don't get like, um, seek first and the others, you know, we have to do this like massively. We have to do this like in ev everywhere, not just like before, like after I've vaccinated mine, I would give some of them. Like we have to do this like um, as a group. Like, Shanta, yes. we were talking there about <clears throat> vaccines. Uh, you're all roughly of the same age group. Uh, I assume none of you have had a, a first vaccine. When do you think you're likely to get one? Myself? Sure, I was going to ask Shunta this first of all. Um, I'm in Paris at the moment. Actually, I had my first vaccination uh, this week and I have my second one at the end of July. So the, the speed at which vaccinations is being rolled out is clearly faster here than in France than in Japan, but also in um, many other countries. Uh, and I think, you know, it is vital that at this summit, you know, G7 leaders show and Keep in mind that until the pandemic is over for everyone, it's not over for anyone. And so I would urge um, the G7 leaders to really think about how can they you know, increase access to vaccines globally and not just in their own countries. So you've had your first vaccine because you're there in Paris as opposed to being back home in Tokyo. What, what about the rest of you? Yande, have you had uh, a vaccination there? Unfortunately not. I have not had my vaccine. And, and do you have any idea when that might actually happen, the sort of time frame we're talking about? I mean, we do not have an idea. I am not in a school going age group. I'm currently getting into my first year of university. So hopefully we see the universities taking up a step and perhaps government reaching universities for university students to be vaccinated. But as of now, I have no idea.
Well, look, stay with me because I want to move to our next area of discussion, uh, gender equality, because uh, in March this year, the UK government launched the G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council. Its main objectives are protection from violence, the liberating force of education and economic empowerment. All of the evidence shows that the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women and girls. According to the UN, it will result in 13 million additional child marriages. For every three months the lockdown continues, an additional 15 million additional cases of gender-based violence are also expected. And in 2020, women lost more than $800 billion in income globally. Those are just some of the stats. Uh, Yande, uh, I know you take a huge amount of interest on this. Uh, the Malala Fund found that 20 million girls had dropped out as a result of the pandemic from education. Is that something that you are seeing firsthand around you? Of course, I think when we talk about these 20 million girls, 13 million, these are people, these are not just statistics. This is the potential of our countries, of our economies, of our world going down the drain. Education is a big gender equality issue. And again, we must urge G7 leaders to transform education systems for gender equality to truly achieve sustainable change. I mean, we have fewer girls being enrolled in schools by the day. Girls are being sold into marriages and are unable to get an education. And gender stereotypes continue to perpetuate patriarchal norms and stereotypes within our textbooks. And when we see these problems, we need to require solutions. And that is why we're saying enough is enough, enough is enough. We can no longer continue like this. We need to demand that G7 leaders step up to making gender equality the very DNA of our education plans and policies with the implementation of young people in ministries of education, education boards, but above all, having concrete investments, concrete solutions, and concrete accountability. We must put gender equality at the forefront and at the center if we truly are to achieve change. Yes, it has been on the agenda before. Shunta, uh, in terms of uh, the issue of uh, gender inequality in Japan, uh, give me an idea uh, about the situation back home and what do you think is needed from G7? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the point that we need to increase uh, the emphasis on girls' education globally is vital, but we need to also supplement that and we want to see G7 leaders also make that commitment at home. If we're talking about economic empowerment, um, we know that inequality between men and women stubbornly persists in all areas of work, for example, from hiring practices to day-to-day -day work and even promotional uh, opportunities. And more needs to be done to close these gaps. And actually, if you look at the data, Japan has the highest gender pay gap uh, between women in full-time employment and men at 23.5% in the G7 countries. Um, so that's why I've been very strongly pushing at the Youth 7 Summit, which is hosted by Future Leaders Network, that we need to call for G7 leaders to actually put in place policies to close these gender gaps. That means things like reforming parental leave to encourage working fathers to take absence from work and be more involved in raising children. But it also might mean requiring employers to report gender pay gaps among employees to hold them accountable. Yep. Estrella, let me turn to you because uh, give me a description in terms of what it is like where you are across all of the issues we're talking about. So education, work roles, safety for women. I know that you're particularly concerned about that. Of course, um, my context now is I'm living in rural Mexico. I'm living up in the mountains. So um, I was not prepared for what I was going to find in here. Like I was, I'm finding that 14 year old girls are, are having kids like post pandemic. We are having like, we are, um, having the kids of the pandemic now, so so we call them right because these girls, um, the rate at their at what they are getting like um, pregnant, it's 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 amazing. Uh, we're getting fourteen year olds uh, at, by the time at my age, twenty four are twenty four year olds are having three kids already. So um, girls are with the knowledge in here, with the mentality that only they have value if they can have kids and have their husbands happy, which is, of course, um, producer that you, which is, of you course, can, gender inequality. I, I know you told our producer you can't do normal things, go out uh, without taking a man with you. You feel that insecure. It's that bad, is it? I feel, yeah, I feel, and, and when you start modifying uh, certain activities that you want to do just because, you know, you like it, when you start modifying them just because of the just because you're a woman, that's that's gender equality at its core. I cannot go on a run without uh, asking my one of my guy friends uh, to, to walk with me because I feel so insecure. Actually, in March, uh, this March, um, the last March that we had, it was the most violent um, month in Mexico for women with about like 267 femicides in just 30, 31 days. So, so you can uh, have like a picture of 
what's happening in, in here yes. in Mexico. And that, COVID has created the perfect setting for, for that domestic violence to perpetuate. Yes, that is uh, a real snapshot. Uh, Himanshu, uh, in terms of uh, gender inequality, it, it is ingrained in society there in India. I know that uh, you've also been working in uh, the Himalayas, uh, helping uh, women with projects there. Uh, are you seeing say in India, different things happening in, in different states, any sort of progress at all in this area? Absolutely. I mean, discrimination against uh, women and girls, it, it's been um, a phenomenon since a really long time in India. And um, um, there, have, there have been, I mean, there obviously is a need for political intervention at all these stages where uh, increased um, representation of women in political spheres or um, education, training, giving them the right opportunities, a right to properties, right to, um, you know, um, to raise their voice. So um, th there have been um, um, a lot of these efforts that have been taking place where, yeah. um, um, especially in, in so, so when it comes to gender, I mean, India is a very culturally driven place. And um, in certain parts of the region, I mean, it's, it's the women are the leaders of the household, um, for example, in the towards the northern part of towards the Himalayan region. So they are the one who are, um, you know, driving the income, um, um, you know, so the, it's, it's it, 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 it is something that has really, really, um, um, you know, so started to come up among the youth as well, where there's yep. a lot of movement taking place for um, women rights. A last question in this section. Uh, I want to go back to Yanda because uh, it's not just at the G7 level, it's at the, the micro level as well. I was reading that uh, uh, you told our producer at the age of seven you refused to do the dishes just because you were a girl. You insisted your brothers did it. You also want to be Zambia's president. You started advocacy at the age of 15. In terms of that, who do you end up talking to? That's, that's a very good question. Who do we end up talking to? I'll start by saying we start by talking to young people and adolescents who are on the ground, who are mobilizing, who are organizing, who want a better world. We've also been talking to different leaders within the key decision-making spaces of education, talking about how we can implement and co-create accountability mechanisms, gender transformative education systems, because we're committed to making this world better and achieving the sustainable development goals. I think if anything, from what I take, having the right people at the right table with the right voices is key to changing this world and again it's a message to the G7 leaders that we must bring young people to key decision making tables otherwise our decisions yeah. are simply insufficient. Let me move on to the final area I wanted to do in this half hour because uh, the focus on mental health it's not on the agenda at G7 but every young person we spoke to when we put uh, these panels together raised it as an issue that affects their daily life and believes it should be a priority for G7 leaders. The statistics are startling. In most countries mental health issues among 15 to 24 year olds have doubled or more during the last year and young people were 30% to 80% more likely to report symptoms of depression or anxiety than adults in March 2021, a year after lockdown was enforced in most countries around the world. In addition, mental health support for young people, notably in schools, universities and workplaces, has been heavily disrupted by the COVID restrictions. Let's go back to the panel and to Shunta, because I know you've done surveys on exactly this between 14 and 40 year olds and the figures are startling. Tell me a little bit more. Yeah, so we actually asked over a thousand young people in Japan what they want to see the Japanese government prioritize action on in health issues in the lead up to the G7. And mental health came up first, even above things like pandemic preparedness or vaccine distribution. And really, it's been a similar story across our surveys in all of the G7 countries. And that's why we've been really strongly pushing uh, to have mental health included um, in the agenda. Um, and it's not, you know, as you mentioned already, it's not just our survey. Um, in you know, national surveys done by national statistical agencies confirm that. And actually in the US, you're looking at almost half of young adults experiencing symptoms, anxiety or depression just last month. Uh, just um, two, two sentences, if you would. Uh, in Japan, how open are, are people uh, ready to talk about it? That's a major challenge. And ho my hope is that, you know, the unfortunate circumstances around Naomi Osaka's withdrawal from the uh, French Open, that kind of stimulates the discussion. Um, but we actually, again, asked how comfortable would you be uh, approaching a mental health clinic or, or seeing a psychiatrist? And more than two thirds of respondents said they would be reluctant. So that really shows the scale of the challenge we face. And I think even within G7 countries, we're at different stages. Estrella, let me bring you in because I know this is an issue very close to your heart. It has directly affected people very close to you, hasn't it? Yes, I mean, 
um, mental health problems have always existed, right? But COVID has created the perfect setting for them to happen like even more easily. So um, what I lived through, I mean, isolation uh, and then just like living through all this uh, war emotionally and physically takes a toll on you. And um, yeah, I realized that even more in COVID, people were feeling like what we're getting hit by this loneliness, by this physical isolation, by this uncertainty of what's going to happen in the future. And um, I have uh, very close uh, people to me that that actually committed suicide for this uh, in in this two months uh, that that was and, and uh, this is an issue that has to be spoken about that you have to speak about you know why why is it so hard to um, accept that you can also get sick in your mind when when you break the leg you know you get you go to the doctor and then just get attention then yeah. just get treatment and you get better. Why, if you get sick to your mind, you you don't don't do that? Well, know? well, all so of the we all need of the to normalize that. All of the panelists, as you said, that uh, are nodding in agreement. Himanshu, let me bring you in because I know in yes. the middle of the, this pandemic, you returned to India because you were dealing with certain issues. Uh, just just take me briefly through that. What what were you so so struggling with during this pandemic? Um, I mean, COVID has is, is pretty much made things worse for everybody who's in isolation. And my expectation from university when I was coming to the UK was obviously like any other student to, you know, explore, to talk to people, to network. But um, as it's been, isolation um, really made things difficult for me. Um, it, it, um, so mental health is something that's been a huge problem um, around society in India when it comes to pressure from society regarding career, education, etc. And and that this is something that I really, really uh, personally went through um, during my sure. time over here. And I felt that this is something that uh, it, you know the youth of India ha don't really have that that chance to speak up and openly about and raise concern with their family or the society because of the stigma that there is. And I am really, really um, happy um, that, 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 that there is a lot of progress being made towards this front because the, now, I mean, the, 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 the young people have really started to talk about it openly. And that is the reason why someone like me um, in this stage of my life, I was able to get help that I needed. Really briefly, in terms of support, I know you were open with your parents, but uh, I mentioned in the introduction about uh, how COVID has interrupted support. Uh, is that what you found as well? Absolutely. I mean, um, um, so medical services, especially related to mental health, are, are, are difficult to come by these days. And um, um, luckily, because of the network that I had, I was able to get in touch with friends and some family doctors. But this, is, this is, isn't the case with everybody. I mean, I did have to go back home for um, my um, just for my mental my mental health, you know, um, and um, it's, it's something that I thought was really, really necessary yeah. for, for my well-being. And it's important. Yeah. We are running out of time, so two quick final questions. Yande, to you, first of all, we heard about anxiety, depression. Is that what you're seeing around you? What is it that is the driver here? Is it fear? Is it isolation? Is it the fact that all of your lives have changed looking forward? What, what, what do you think it is? I think it's just this assumption that even as we're living in this global pandemic, we still need to function as normal. We still need to do our work. We still need to make money. We still need to do and take care of all these other things of our lives while living in a global pandemic and sometimes in different parts of the world quarantine. And that's dangerous. That's a very big problem. I think even within our education systems and within our schools, these are not issues that are being addressed. Depression and anxiety are being thrown away or they're not being taken seriously. We're being told to toughen up and that's an issue and it needs to be addressed. It's yep. important that recovery and self-care is being taught and taught meaningfully. Yeah. Shunta, a, a, a quick word with you, because I know that uh, you lobbied for this to be on the agenda. Were you surprised it wasn't? And I know you also talked to the UK Chancellor uh, in terms of the, the pushback, why it wasn't. What, what were you being told? So, you know, I'm not overly surprised that mental health wasn't on the agenda. It's an area that's been un an area of underinvestment and insufficient attention over the years. Um, and I just made the case that we need um, expenditure, increased financing for mental health, and not just obviously in the men in the health system and for mental health services, but also thinking about what we do in schools, in workplaces, in youth centres, and beyond to really address this um, youth mental yeah. health crisis. Um, and you know, in terms of response, I, I think he took it on board, but we didn't hear anything. 
uh, concrete, uh, any kind of concrete promise or anything let, that um, mental health would be on the agenda. Let me really, really quickly ask all four of you the same question. It needs to be a one word answer if you could. Optimistic or pessimistic that uh, you'll get real, real progress from the G7? Estrella, to you first of all, one word if you could. Oh, oh, sorry, I, I lost a... Uh, Optimistic or pessimistic you. about this meeting? Oh, optimistic, of course. Shunta, to you. Optimistic, but it's up to the leaders to show they're going to make change. Himanchu, one word. Optimistic, definitely. And finally, Yande, one word for you. Optimistic, because we are watching. Well... My word. Uh, unanimity to end the programme. So I hope those leaders are watching. We have run out of time. Uh, thanks to all of you, my panellists, uh, and for joining me and for speaking so candidly. We shall watch in the coming days how much of what they've been advocating translates into what the G7 commits to do. Do stay with us on BBC News for more coverage of the G7. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.